All right, Galatians chapter 3, let's pray and let's dig into the Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. We ask, Lord, now as we go to your Word, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Not the words of a man that would be a waste of our time, but the Word of God may go forth with power. And Lord, give us all ears to hear what you would say to us. We thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. By way of quick review, Galatians was the most exhortive letter, in my opinion, the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote many letters in the Bible, and he wrote it to the churches in the region of Galatia. There were many churches there, Antioch, Lystra, among others. Antioch was the first place that the, uh, the... followers of Christ were called Christians. And so in that region, he had been a pastor there for some time. And he got word back that so quickly they had gotten away from the simple truth of God's word. It said back in Galatians 1, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who, who, trouble, who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. See, if if anybody adds to the gospel, it's another gospel. It's a false gospel. Can I get an amen to that? And he says in that verse, there isn't another gospel. There's just the truth, and there's a lie. And when you add to the gospel of Christ, it becomes a lie. He then says, but even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let that person be accursed or anathema. So he's, his heart is broken to hear the word coming back to him, that after he had pastored that church for some time, that so quickly they were listening to these, this group called Judaizers who were coming into the region and telling people, well, yeah, it's Jesus, but you got to be circumcised too. And you got to keep the law of Moses. And you got to keep, and they're adding to the gospel. And they're basically telling Gentiles, if you want to be a Christian, you kind of have to become a Jew first, and then you'll be eligible to become a Christian. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it's finished. Amen. And Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. In chapter 2, it said, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the, fa- in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then in Galatians 2.21, it says, If righteousness comes through the law then Jesus Christ died in vain. Guys, if we could get saved by our good works, then Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. Amen? Amen. Now, last week, we looked at the first nine verses of chapter 3, and I tell the message by faith or by works. Are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Is it because we were so good that we got saved? Or did we get saved in spite of how sinful we really are? It's by grace we've been saved, right? And so we saw last week just that clear picture of the, comp- the, the contrast between those who believe they were saved by their good works and understanding that we truly have been saved by faith. Now this morning, if you have your outline, grab it. And I tell the message, we're going to pick up on verse, uh, verse 15. Um, I tell the message, by law or by promise? By law or by promise? So what are we trusting in for our salvation? Is it the law or the promises of God? Is it the law that we think that we followed or we're keeping the law? Is that what we base our salvation on? Or the promises that God has made to us and who, what our Savior made to us at the cross? So by law or by promise, first we're going to see the curse of the law this morning. By the way, if you're new to Calvary Chapel, I'll always tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you, then I'll tell you what I told you. Amen? Because we need a little repetition. Can I get an amen to that? All right, so this is what, I'm telling you what we're going to tell you, right? So first of all, we're going to see the curse of the law. The law was, was created by God. The law is from the Lord, but the law can't save anybody. So why does the law exist? We'll talk about that. We're going to see, secondly, our unchanging promise in Christ. Man, I'm so glad that my, my salvation isn't based on my promises or my faithfulness. Can I get an amen to that? The unchanging promises of Christ. Then we're going to see the purpose of the law. Again, why the law truly exists. And then lastly, that we are all one in Christ. So Paul continues his defense of the true gospel in these verses this morning. And he's going to refute the claims of the Judaizers that man uh, could not be saved apart from the law. I mentioned this last week. We'll see it this morning. Do you know that they said you needed to be circumcised? Do you know that Abraham was counted righteous 14 years before he was circumcised? They said you needed the law to be saved, and Abraham was counted righteous 430 years before the law came. So circumcision 
and the law given by the Lord, praise God for it, they are not the source of salvation. Amen? In any way, shape, or form. And yet we still fall into the trap of wanting to add to the gospel. If you were really saved, you would do this. And the reality is that fruit is, I mean, obedience is fruit of salvation, but it's not the source of it. Amen? Keeping of the law is fruit of salvation, but it's not the source of it. So we'll see that this morning. Let's begin there in verse 10, looking at the curse of the law. The curse of the law. So we saw the fruits of the law, of faith last week, it, the steadfast promises of God, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, His miraculous works, again, salvation even before the law existed, the blessings of God, and then it brings us to verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Here's the deal. If you want the law to be your source of salvation, the 613 laws of Moses in the Old Testament, you must keep all of them and have kept all of them since the day you were born. Anybody qualify? Anybody do that yesterday? Amen? Kept all the laws, fulfilled every law. I know 10 of them by heart. How about you? No other God before me, no graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your mother and father. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's possessions. Amen. And as you go through the Ten Commandments, oh, I, bro I broke that one, I broke that one, oh, I broke that one. Oh, thou shalt not lie. Oh, you're li you know. You say you didn't break them, you're a liar anyway. Amen. So here's the reality. So the truth is, if you're putting your faith in the law, you just walk around burdened all day. You walk around burdened all day and overwhelmed because you can't do it. And he says, here's the curse of the law. You're under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all of it. I shared that story before, the, the Jewish man that I met. I've got all these laws I must keep. And I said, how's that working out for you? How are you doing with that? Oh, it's, it's very difficult. No, it's not difficult. It's impossible. You know, Jesus came to save sinners. Amen. And the curse of the law is it reveals sin, as we'll see later on, as a schoolmaster that leads us to the cross. And so if you're putting your faith in the law, if you're putting your faith in your good works, see, the only reason can people start to put faith in their own good works, they're comparing themselves to the wrong person. Amen? I put my faith in myself because I'm comparing myself to Osama bin Laden. I'm no Adolf Hitler. I'm glad you're aiming the bar high for yourself. Amen? <laughs> I, I'm, no, I'm no Jeffrey Dahmer, I'm no, you know, and we compare ourselves to the worst person, and in those cases, we can look pretty good. Now compare yourself to Jesus. How you doing? All have fallen short of the glory of God, amen? And the reason that people get legalistic, they're comparing themselves to other sinners, we need to compare ourselves to the Savior, amen? And when we see who we are in comparison to Him, it keeps us humble and broken and desperate and makes us realize how we cannot live without him. Paul's addressing those who think their addition of the, of, of the law to the cross would give them right standing before God. And again, in Genesis 15, Abraham was counted righteous. They were demanding circumcision, but they were, didn't realize that he was counted righteous 14 years before he was circumcised. And here Paul addresses both the law's stiff penalty and its incredible demands. Those who choose the law as their means of right standing before God or under the curse, because that's what they will be judged by on Judgment Day. See, most people, when you talk to them, they will say, I'm a good person. If you ask somebody, are you a good person? Rarely will they say no, no matter who they are. I did, I've done prison ministry off and on for 30 years. I'll go into prison, I, I'm death row. Guys killed seven people. You a good person? Yeah, I'm good. I'm a good person. Well, I guess, well, the guy down the road killed 14 people, so I'm not that bad, right? See, there's this mentality that we have that we think we're good. And you know what the law does? It shows us we're not. Amen? Now, the law is a godly standard. And it's a godly standard that, praise God for it. But that godly standard does not save us. It shows us our need for a Savior. Why are all who pursue righteousness through the law, condemned and deserving of death. That's what the Bible tells us. For the law to be the standard for righteousness, you must have kept it all perfectly for your entire life. One of the things I do when I witness to people, one of the first things I want to do is when I have an opportunity to talk to them 
uh, is I love to get them, get them where we all need to be, first recognizing we're sinners. Because if we don't recognize we're sinners, we'll never see our need for a Savior. Amen? Well, if there is a God, I'm sure I'm okay. By the way, God doesn't grade under a curve, He grades at the cross. Can I get an amen to that? And so we don't compare ourselves to others, and the exhortation here is, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things. And James said, if you break the law in one point, you're guilty of them all. You want to be righteous by your works? You'd better be perfect. And guess what? There's only been one who's perfect, and that's our Savior. Verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Understand the audience. These are like the, almost like the Pharisees, right? These guys who were so driven by the law. Guys, is there anybody ever in the Bible who knew the law better than the guy writing this letter? Can I get an amen to that? The Apostle Paul was Saul of Tarsus. He was as legalistic as they got. He was out chasing down Christians. He was he was the arch enemy of the Christian church. He knew the law as well as anybody who ever lived. And now he's letting them know that the law can't save you. The law, if you're justified by the law in the sight of God, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. No one ever has been or ever will be justified before God by their obedience to the law. The Judaizers may have felt that they were more holy because they kept the law. Like the self-righteous Pharisees, they may, have been, they may have fooled men or even each other, but God saw their hearts. How many guys sinned this week? Okay. Got a room full of sinners in here. And you came to church to hang out with them anyway. Can I get an amen to that? Now, the Lord sees us holy, doesn't he? He sees us through the shed blood of his son. And we're new creations in Christ. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're no longer slaves to sin. Amen? And, and Christians aren't sinless, but we should sin less. Amen? And the reality is that our life has changed. Our priorities have changed. Our passions have changed. But I am so thankful that I'm not being judged by keeping the law perfectly because I would, do, I would just walk around in constant condemnation. God knows our hearts. He knows every thought. You know what's amazing to me? He who knows you best loves you most. And doesn't that blow you away? He knows everything you think, everything you've ever done, stuff you don't want your spouse to know, stuff you want nobody to know, the thoughts you've had that you just, oh, how, where did that, and the Lord knows, and he still loves you more than anybody else on this planet loves you, amen? He loves you so much, he'd rather die than live without you. Why would anybody, why do you want to earn grace, try to earn it by the law? Why would anybody want to strive to try to attain it and be more holy than everyone else? Now, holiness be holy for I am holy is something God's called us to. But again, as I say often, it's fruit of salvation, not the source of salvation. He says there, the just shall live by faith. That's a quote from the book of Habakkuk. And it's one of the most important and most quoted verses in all the New Testament. The law can't make you just. It can only bring the curse. It can only show you that you're a sinner. And guys, praise God for the law revealing our sinfulness. Only one thing a, a, a cursed man can do to be just, he has to reach out in faith to Almighty God, seek His forgiveness, accept His grace. We can only be justified by faith and cursed by the law. So faith justifies. We talked about this a lot, bears repeating, just as if you never sinned. Once you surrender your life to the Lord, He's paid for your sin, past, present, and future. We've been justified, we're being sanctified, made more into the image of our Savior. Sanctified means set apart unto God. Till the day we're glorified, that won't happen until we get to heaven. So we've been justified, we're being sanctified, till the day we're glorified. And why would we want to go back and try to make this happen on our own, in our own strength? How many of you guys do New Year's resolutions? How many of you guys have done a New Year's resolution and kept it for the whole year? See, and lying's a sin, so keep those hands down, amen? But that's in our own strength, right? In our own strength, we fail. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? It's by His grace and by His mercy and by His love. So we live by faith. Now, again, faith, we talked about it at, at extensively last week. and grab a copy of the CD. What faith is and what faith isn't. Faith isn't just believe in something. Faith is only as good as the object you put your faith in. And our faith is in Jesus Christ. Amen? And we put our faith in the true and the living God. But, our, but true faith in God will reveal a transformed life. Now look what it says in verse 12. Yet the law is not of faith. The man who does them shall live by them. The law is not of faith. It promises no forgiveness, but requires obedience. It's not what do you believe, it's what have you done. 
If you're living by the laws, what have you done? What have you done? What are you doing? What have you done? What are you doing? Those people that come and knock on your door to have a better understanding of who they are. Sadly, it's not a lot of born-again Christians. There should be more of us knocking on doors. Can I get an amen to that? They're willing to do more for a lie than we'll do for the truth. But they come to our door. They're trying to earn heaven. They're on their do list. And they go door to door trying to be good enough and qualify to somehow get to heaven or inherit the earth in the case of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, you can have this place. But, but the reality is that they're trying to earn it and, and you never arrive. And here's the reality as Christians, we should all know this. Christianity is not a hope so, it's a no so. Amen? I don't hope I'm going to heaven. If I say, do you know if you're going to heaven? I hope so. You don't know Jesus then. Because when you know Jesus, you know so. Who knows they're going to heaven? Who knows? Praise the Lord, amen? Isn't it good to know? The worst thing the world can do to me is the best thing that can happen to me. You can't threaten me with heaven, amen? I was violently ill over the weekend. I missed the baptism. And I mean, just laid out ill. And I was like, death would be good now. I'd be good with death. I'm, Lord, death, if death happens now, I'm good because heaven's better. Can I get an amen? And the reality is that if you're living under the grace of God, you, have, you know where you're headed. It gives you a different perspective on this life. And if you walk around under the bondage of the law, trying to be good enough to earn heaven, the Pharisees, do you think they were a happy bunch? You think if you hung out with the Pharisees, there'd be a lot of laughing? Have you ever met anybody who was legalistic and had joy at the same time? You know what I mean? It's almost like we're trying to make each other more miserable. Well, I don't do anything. I gave up, I gave up ice cream this week now. I'm not doing that either. I gave up TV. I gave up, I gave up more than you did. I gave up. I don't sleep anymore. I, I lay on a bed of nails. You know. And there's this mentality, like if the more that we deprive ourselves, somehow we'll be more pleasing to God. But did he not come, came, come that we might have life and life more abundant? Can I get an amen to that? Isn't the fruit of the Holy Spirit love and joy and peace? Christian, Christians shouldn't be walking around looking like we've been sucking on a lemon. Amen? We've got to have the joy of the Lord. And he's saying, look, if you're under the law, there's a burden that comes with it. And they came into this church in, Cor in, the, you know, in, in the area of Galatia, and they started telling them, you guys haven't done enough. You've got to do more. There's more things you've got to do, or you're not really saved. And if you want to be, you've got to add to the cross. And that's such a lie. It's another gospel. And this entire letter is, is a correction for the people doing that. See, under the law, we've all fallen short. No matter how many laws you've burdened yourself with, legalism and works, it cannot produce salvation, and it does not even produce a closer walk. Here's what I have found. If you're legalistic, you're always looking at the law and comparing yourself. Here's what we should be doing. We should be looking unto Jesus always. Amen? Our priority ought to be, I want to get closer to my Savior. I want to fall more in love with the Lord. Not, ooh, I'm keeping more laws now. I'm better. I got a list of laws here, and I'm, now I'm, I've got rid of that and got rid of that. Oh, look how much more holy I am. And then that's all based on, my, on me. And I found this to be true. When you're super legalistic, you're so focused on the laws, you don't have much of a relationship with the Savior. Amen? When I wake up in the morning, I talk to, I talk to my best friend, the Lord. When I open up His Word, He talks to me. When I spend time in prayer, I'm, I'm, I'm having a discussion with the Creator of the universe. And I'm not worried about laws. I'm worried about the love relationship I have with him. Now, again, we're going to talk about the laws. It, it exists for a reason. And praise God for it. And it is a good standard, right? Praise God for the law. Guys, if there was no speed limit, we'd all drive 110 and there'd be accidents all over the place. Amen? And we'd all think we weren't speeding. You put up, you know, 65 mile an hour speed limit, and now you know you're in trouble. Amen? So the law is a taskmaster that leads us to the cross. It, it shows us that we're sinners. And it's a good standard to live a life that is honoring to the Lord, but it cannot save you. It cannot save you. And it doesn't even sanctify you. And look what it says in verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ has redeemed us. He paid the price we couldn't pay. We stand before the judge guilty. I owe, I owe five trillion dollars and I got four bucks. I'm in trouble. I can't pay the debt. I'm done. I can't raise the debt. There's nothing else I can do to save myself. I'm done. I'm doomed. And you know what's amazing? Is Jesus came and paid the debt for us. Because he's the only one that could. Amen? He's the only one that was sinless. He's the only one that was perfect. He's the only one that is perfect. 
and only he could pay the price for us. And that's why we don't put our faith in Buddha, because Buddha's dead and couldn't pay the price for anybody. Amen? Muhammad is dead. All the false prophets of this world, Joseph Smith, all of them, dead. Jesus Christ, risen and living Savior, who triumphed over sin and death and loved you so much, he was willing to be cursed as if he lived your life so you could be forgiven as if you lived his. What a great and awesome God we serve. Amen? We're rewarded like we lived his life. We don't deserve that. And he suffered as if he lived mine and yours. He certainly didn't deserve that. Can we get an amen to that? He was a curse for us. And we can go through the cross and all the, the, the scourging and the mocking and the torture and all that he endured. And I think the, great, the most difficult part for all, of all of it for the Savior was to be separated from the Father. When all the sin of mankind was placed upon him, when the world grew dark and the earth quaked, and he knew separation from the Father. He was willing to know separation from the Father so that you and I might know intimacy with the Father. What a great God we serve. Can I get an amen to that? Amen? What a great God we serve. And yet we would try to make it us, about us somehow. Something we've done, something we've earned, something we've accumulated, something we've accomplished. Guys, whenever we do that, we take the focus off our Savior and the greatest act of love in all of human history going to the cross of Calvary. He became a curse for me was cursed on our behalf. I was listening to a worship CD on the way here this morning, and our old worship team in Santa Cruz wrote a song uh, that they would play at communion every month. And, it was, and it, basically the song is, he didn't die in vain. He died for a reason, amen? And he thought about you on the cross. Think about that. He thought about you. Because he loves you, he was willing to be cursed and be tormented. He redeemed us, he restored us, but it came at a heavy price. See, salvation is a free gift, but that doesn't mean it didn't cost somebody something, amen? It's free for us, but it cost our Savior everything, amen? He left heaven and came to earth, lived a sinless, perfect life, and then was tormented and tortured and beat and mocked and scourged and endured it all of love for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Paul's quoting from Deuteronomy 21, clearly revealed throughout the Old Testament, uh, this prophetic picture of the cross of Calvary, the price Christ paid to redeem us from our sin. Look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now this is an important verse. Pay attention. The blessing of Abraham did not come by keeping the law. We're going to talk about this, and some of this might be a little different than what you've ever heard, but if you read the Bible and read the whole Bible, the seed of Abraham is not the Jewish people. Now, is God, does God bless the Jewish people? What's the answer? Are they his chosen people? Does God have great things in store for them? But in the context, it says that he's going to be a blessing, the seed of Abraham will be a blessing to all nations. And the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. And he's the one through whom we're saved. Now, again, I, I'm as pro-Israel as anybody on this planet. And I love the Jewish people. I planted a church in a city that's 70% Jewish. Why? Because I love the Jewish people. And this is a Jewish book written by Jewish people about a Jewish Savior. Can I get an amen to that? So praise God for that. But don't, the seed of Abraham, they always want to point, well, that's Israel. No, it's Jesus. And the proof is right here in this verse. In these two verses right here. It says this, Abraham... We'll, we'll, read, we'll read down a few more verses. But it says there, upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Now, how does the blessing come to us? It doesn't come through the law. It comes through Christ Jesus. Then we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Is the law mentioned in there anywhere? It's through the Spirit, by the Spirit, through faith in Christ. So Christ is the answer. It comes by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our lives to make us new creations in Christ. And yet people still want to run to the law and hold on to the law. Guys, it's not the law that saves us. Look, I'm, I'm like anybody. I want to live a holy life. Who wants to live a holy life? I want to live holy and set apart. I want to obey. But here's what I have found to be true. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not, it's not limited to just what is in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit convicts me about things that aren't even in the Bible. Can I get an amen to that? And I get convicted, and I know if I continue to do that, I'm outside of God's will. But here's the difference. I'm not trying to keep the law so he will love me. I'm keeping the law because he loves me, and he knows what's best for me. And I'm, I'm following the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life because he, he's my heavenly father. How many of you guys have kids? Okay? When you discipline your kids, you discipline them because you love them. Amen? 
Because you want to keep them from harm. Because you want them to grow. Amen? And the Lord convicts us too. And the conviction comes by the Holy Spirit. Again, the blessing of Abraham came not by keeping the law, and the Gentiles did not have to become Jews to know the blessing that comes from the Lord. And again, it came upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Not by works, not by the law, not by circumcision, not by religion, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Guys, we're Christians. Can I get an amen to that? We're followers of Jesus Christ. It's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. And guys, people have taken this book and the simplicity of the gospel and they've tried to add to it and it takes away from the simple truth of the cross of, the, of, cross of Calvary. Guys, may we never add to the cross. Amen? Through whom we received the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 that the Holy Spirit is a down payment on heaven. It's like ownership papers. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. It's it's, it, you've been redeemed. You got, you've been adopted into his family. The Bible says that no one will ever snatch us out of his hand. Guys, that ought to bring joy to no matter what we're going through in life. Can I get an amen to that? No matter what I'm going through, I belong to the Lord. No matter what trial I'm in, my, my heavenly Father loves me. No matter what I'm, I may face in the day, I know that God is in control and he's on my side and he knows what's best for me and I can trust his faithfulness. I can trust his promises. I can trust his character. Amen? And you know why we get bummed out about temporary stuff? is we forget how great our God is. And we forget who's in control. And we forget His promises. Amen? Help us. And you know why we do? Because we don't spend enough time in His Word. Can I get an amen to that? He comforts us in times of difficulty, and He convicts us in times of disobedience. He comforts us when we need to be comforted. But He convicts us when we need to be convicted. All received not by works, but by faith in our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, our Redeemer, our God and our King, Jesus Christ. By faith or by works. Well, we saw the curse of the law. We don't see that the law can save us in any way. The law, we will see it defined more clearly here in a few verses. Point number two, by the law, by promise. We saw the curse of the law, the law's sentence of condemnation and death. Then our unchanging promise in Christ. Look at verse 15. Brethren, I speak in a manner of men, though it, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now he's taking these guys, can remember these guys are really into the law. He's taking them back to the covenant. And he says, when two men make a covenant, it cannot be changed. That was God's law. When they made the covenant, it was a covenant for a lifetime. So here's the covenant. The promise has been made. And so Paul, I love how he, he addresses them. He calls them brethren. He started off, oh foolish Galatians, at the beginning of this chapter. But he still considers them brothers in Christ. And even though we may not be operating the way that we should, we're still family. Can I get an amen to that? And that's how he views them. And he's, in, he's encouraging them as his brothers in Christ. They've gotten off track. They're trying to add to the gospel of grace. They're adding the law to it. But he calls them back as brethren. And he says, I speak to you in a manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if confirmed, no one annuls it or adds to it. Even in a covenant between two men, once confirmed by both parties, both signed their names to a contract, and it cannot be added to or taken away from. How much more unchanging are the promises of God? If we make a covenant and it was legally binding forever, how much more are God's promises to us that they're never going to change? When God promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you, guess what? That means he will never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you, Lord. Amen? His promise that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. You know what that means? If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Amen? And we can read to the Bible all the promises of God and he will never stray from them. We can trust his word. He says it. It's the truth. We can take it to the bank. God confirmed his promise to Abraham in that covenant with a blood sacrifice. In Abraham's day, when two parties wanted to seal an agreement, they would cut an animal in half and meet in the middle. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But they'd cut an animal in half, and the blood would be spread, and they'd stand in between this animal in two pieces. And it was signifying that they were dead serious about their covenant. Amen? 
And Abraham cut a bull in half and waited for God to show up. Abraham waiting, eventually a deep sleep fell upon him. It says in Genesis 15, And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch passed between the pieces. God's covenant with Abraham could not be altered or added to by the Judaizers. So too do the, the, does the promises apply to us. It says there in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed... Were the promises made? He does not say, and to seeds, as many but as to one, and to your seed who is? What did I say before? The seed of Abraham? What does that say? What does that verse say? It's Christ. Amen? He, said, he didn't say, and to your seeds. He says, to the seed. Now, he's father Abraham, and yes, he became a great, through him came a great nation, but guess what? He's talking about the blessing to all nations that came through Abraham, and that's Jesus. And he is the only one. And guess what? Abraham's faith, even though he didn't know, he had faith in God, he had faith in the coming Messiah, he was saved the same way that you and I are, because his faith was in Jesus. His faith was in the Messiah that is coming, even though he didn't fully grasp who it was. Their faith was looking forward to the Messiah, our faith is looking back, and it's the same salvation. Can I get an amen? And it's the same God. Can I get an amen to that? It was always about Jesus. It's always been Jesus. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In the minds of the Judaizers, they and the other Jews were Abraham's seed to whom God had made his promises. And thus the law of Moses given to the Jews had superseded the Abrahamic covenant. And Paul makes it clear that God's promise was to Abraham and his seed. Through him and his seed, all the nations shall be blessed. And again, the word seed is not plural for the Jews. The, seed, the word seed is singular. It's Jesus. Guys, our salvation isn't through Judaism. Our salvation is through Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen to that? Our salvation is not through Calvary Chapel. It's through Jesus Christ. Our salvation is in through any other group, any denomination. It's through the Lord. And guys, when we take away from the cross of Calvary, we've completely missed it. Again, our blessing comes through Jesus Christ. Salvation through faith in Christ, not through the keeping of the law. Blessing and fellowship with God, forgiveness of sin, is only possible in Christ. Verse 17. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. That covenant that Abraham made was with Jesus. That's what the text is saying. He made it with God, but it was Jesus Christ. Who is, who is God incarnate on the earth? Who is it? Jesus. When you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's Jesus. Amen? I believe Melchizedek is Jesus. Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek and, and gives him worship. Uh, and it says Melchizedek had no beginning and no end and no genealogy. That's Jesus. So, so we see this relationship Abraham, Abraham has. Again, even though Jesus hasn't fully come in human form, Jesus always has been. Can we get an amen to that? He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And so he's the promise that is to come. He's the seed. He's the blessing. The law did not supersede the promise. See, what they're trying to say is, well, we got the law now, so that's what's important, keeping the law. Well, the promise that gave Abraham faith by which he was already saved had nothing to do with the law because the law didn't come for 430 years later. Now, as I'm saying all this, I'm not bad-mouthing the law. The law has a purpose. Can I get an amen to that? And we'll talk about that in a moment. And I love that there's, laws are good. Can we say amen to that? Laws are good, but laws don't save us. I'm glad. But laws are good. Laws teach us right and wrong. Laws help us to understand. The New Testament saints, again, were justified by looking back. The Old Testament saints were justified by faith in the Messiah who had not yet come. But again, Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The only true source of salvation for any man at any time is Jesus. Verse 18. Again, it says there, For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. By the way, it's an inheritance. You know what inheritance is? Do you earn an inheritance? You get something you didn't earn, you didn't do anything for? You know why you got it? Because you're related. Amen? And you know why we get what we get? Because we're related. We're children of the king. Amen? We've been adopted into his family. So it's an inheritance. Now, if I earned it, it's not an inherit inheritance. Isn't something that's earned. It's a free gift. And if I have to go out and earn it, then it's a paycheck. Amen? 
So when you're trying to be le- when you're legalistically trying to earn heaven through your good works, the Bible says this in Galatians, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son then an heir of God through Christ. We're daughters and sons of God. Amen. Now we're not the son of God, don't mistake that. But we're his children, amen. We're adopted into his family. Guys, that's better than the lottery. Amen. That's the greatest gift you could ever have. It's better than the, that's my 401k, heaven. Amen? It's just better. If the inheritance is of the law or of works, it's based upon my actions, and it's not grace, and it's not a free gift. And the promise is no longer valid. It cannot be earned or be a gift, and be a gift at the same time. It's one or the other. So salvation, is it by law or by promise? Because it can't be both. Is it the promise of God? Is it the covenant of God? Is it the grace of God? Or is it the good works of men? Is it the law of man? Which is it? Well, clearly it's not the law and it's not our good works. Amen? The source of our salvation has always been the same, even before the foundation of the world, our unchanging promise in Christ. And aren't you glad that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? How many of you guys are excited to see Jesus? I I can hardly stand it. I can't wait. You know, I, I might, I, well, I guess you can't sin in heaven. I've run ever over everyone to get to him before you, right? <laughs> Somebody did a painting, and it says first moment in heaven. It's, a, it's a, a girl, and she's got her arms wrapped around Jesus, hanging on to him tight. Your first second in heaven. I don't know if it'll be our first second or not, but, man, I, I wept. I thought, I can't wait. Guys, shouldn't we live every day in light of that moment that's coming? Don't we want to please him? Don't we want to serve him? Is he worthy to be praised and worshiped and honored and glorified? Amen? He's done so much for us. How can we not live for him? So we first see the curse of the law, and then we see our unchanging promise in Christ. It's not in anything but Christ. It's in Christ. Now, the purpose of the law. So that's our day, the law. You've been, so why, does it ha- why do we have the law? Look at verse 19. It'll tell us. What purpose, then, does the law serve? Is it added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made? And it was appointed through the angels by the hand of the mediator. If the law cannot justify us or make us holy, why then does it exist? Well, put in place, at least partially, to put some restraint upon man's actions, that's a fact, to differentiate between behavior that pleases God and behavior that grieves him. You know, the Bible says, you shall not commit adultery. Why? Because adultery breaks the heart of God, adultery breaks the marriage covenant, adultery brings destruction to families. Can we get an amen to that? And adultery separates us from God. It's sinful. It's wicked. Now, I can live my whole life and never commit adultery and still spend eternity in hell separated from God. Amen? Because just keeping a law or keeping even most of the law or even keeping all of the law, if it were possible, would not save me. And that's the difference. And so praise God, but like I said before, I find that The convictions I have go even above and beyond the law often in the way that I should live my life. Ultimately, the the law was added to reveal the sinfulness of man. It added after the gospel was preached to Abraham to show the sinfulness of man and establish his desperate need for God's grace and mercy. Because without conviction, there can be no conversion. See, until you recognize you're a sinner, you'll never see a need for a Savior. So that's my constant discussion when I meet with people or I talk to people about the Lord, I especially love airplanes. Airplane flights are great, especially like when you're going to like India. You get the aisle, you got two captives. It's great. It's like being chained up like the Apostle Paul, right, in prison. I got you for the next 12 hours. You're going to hear about Jesus, right? But when you talk to people, they'll often say they're good, and then you say, well, how do we define good? And then we start, I start going through the Ten Commandments with them. I'll even bribe them. I'll say, like, i got 50 bucks. If you, if you can show me one of the Ten Commandments you didn't break, I'll give this to you right now. That makes them eager to participate. And they, they think they're going to get to thou shalt not murder and they're going to be okay. So you start going through the list. Oh, yeah, I broke that one. I broke that one. I broke that one. I broke that one. Thou shalt not murder. I'm not a murderer. Give me my money. The Bible says if you've ever had hatred in your heart, you committed murder. You ever hated anybody? And they say, I've never hated anybody. So we already told me you're a liar, so I don't believe you anyway. Right? <laughs> Thou shalt not lie. <laughs> what does the law do? It reveals that we're sinners in need of a Savior. See, until the seed came, the law was preparation for the coming Messiah. The solution of man's sin problem is not the source of salvation. Again, 
the law. the law. The law shows us we're sinners, but the law cannot save us. Does that make sense? We're going to see that more completely as we move on. Without a clear understanding of our sin problem, again, we would never see our need for a Savior. He talks about a mediator there. In this case, he's talking about Moses. Uh, the law came to us. And again, notice it said, through angels by the hand of a mediator, Moses. And again, uh, it implied that the law, the commandments were given to Moses by angels. This is in Acts 7. We have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. The angels only instruments for transmitting, again, brought, brought it to him. Moses, the mediator between man and God. God's still using both uh, man to represent him and to minister to others on his behalf. And so Moses was a mediator of the law, but Jesus is now the mediator between sinful man and holy God. Can we get an amen to that? Where is he right now? She had the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. When we pray, we pray to the Father in the name of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? He's the only mediator between man and God. So the law was given through mediators. Look what it says there in verse 20. Now mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. The promise given directly to Abraham by God, no mediator. Jesus is the only one mediator between God and man. This is why you don't need to go to anyone else for prayer. Now you can not pray with others, but you don't have to go to others to get them to pray for you. Now we should pray for each other, but you can go directly to God. Aren't you glad? When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. You can go into the Holy of Holies while you're driving down the freeway. Thank you, Lord. Amen? You can go in the shower, laying in bed at night, wherever you are. You can talk to Almighty God. I tell people this often. I begin my day with the Lord. I I'll begin my day in prayer. Yes, Lord. Talk to the Lord. And I just leave my speakerphone all day. I just don't hang up. Pray without ceasing, for this is the will of God. How else are we going to do it? Can I get an amen to that? And just spend time in intimate relate, fellowship with the Lord all day long. And he's saying, look, he's the mediator. There's only one mediator. And the mediator is not the law. The law reveals our sin, but the law cannot save us. It says there in verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if, if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. You know, if the law could have been given and you could have all kept it, okay. It says the law is not contrary to God. The law was given by God. And we need to thank God for the law. But the law doesn't save us. It gives us direction as Christians on how to live a holy life. But it's not the source of salvation. And those are two separate things. And again, as we walk with the Lord and we get to know Him better, we will be more obedient to the law and we'll also be more obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. We're going to live a more holy life if we're walking with the Lord. But again, we can't live holy enough to earn it. But once we're saved, we can live a more holy life. Does that make sense? I know it sounds like semantics, but it's a big deal. Because if the law comes first, you earned, your, you earned heaven. The law didn't come first, as far as us being able to keep it or walk in holiness. The law defines sin without giving the power to overcome it. The law can only show me how far I failed. It cannot make me righteous. You guys know where the word sin comes from if you've been coming here any length of time? Sin is an archery term. And there's a distance between perfection and where the arrow lands. If the bullseye is perfection and where the arrow lands, they call that the sin distance. How far, by how far you've missed the mark. That's where the term comes from. So we're all sinners, which means we've all missed the mark. And guys, it doesn't matter if we missed it by five inches or 5,000 miles, we've missed the mark. And because we missed the mark, we need to have our sin forgiven. We need to have our sin washed away. The law can't save me. It can't justify me. It can't make me righteous. Why then does it exist? Look at verse 22. But the scripture is confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. See, the law reveals our sin and our desperate need for a savior and it shows that we're all, man is all depraved. By the way, people say men are inherently good. That is the biggest bunch of nonsense ever. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Well, just leave it, you know, mankind is good. No, mankind is wicked and evil. Amen? Mankind would be worse if we got rid of all the police and military. Can we say amen to that? If there weren't those to control the behavior of men to some degree, they'd be even worse. Men left to themselves are selfish. Amen? Perverse, bitter, angry. Mankind is not good. Mankind is evil. And see, we live in a world today that says, oh, all men are good. No, they're not. We're all sinful and we need a Savior. Amen? 
And that's what the law teaches us. I'm not as good as I thought. Again, you go through the Ten Commandments with people and they go, oh yeah, I broke that one, yeah, I broke that one, oh, I broke that one, oh, I broke that one, oh, yeah, I broke, yeah, I broke that one. You get to the end, you go, how many sins does it take to be a sinner? How many murders does it take to be a murderer? One. And I go, well, you just, we just went through ten and you've done all those many times just like I have. Guess what? You're a sinner just like me. God can't have one sin in heaven. He's got earth part two. So what are we going to do? See, it was one sin on this earth that brought death and pain and sorrow. God can't have one sin in heaven because he's perfect, holy God. But we're all sinners, so we've got a problem. So sin, the law, is a taskmaster, as we're going to see, that leads us to the cross. Without Jesus, we're all held in sin's grasp. We cannot be set free through good works. Only those who place their faith in Christ can be delivered from the grasp and the penalty of the sin that we have all committed. Look at verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept from the faith which would afterward be revealed. See, the law initially, the ceremonies, its rites, especially by its sacrifices, all of them pointed to Jesus. And it kept them looking forward to the coming Messiah. You know, they were doing sacrifices they didn't even fully understand, but they were doing them by faith. Why do we bring a lamb in? Because God told us to. They'd bring a lamb and they'd slay a lamb. It slit its throat and sprinkle. You know, Passover. Every time I remember Passover, they take the blood of the lamb and they take the blood and put it in the shape of a cross. And the angel of death, you know, passed over in the original Passover. And every time they were looking back, as they looked back to Passover, they didn't realize they were looking forward to the cross. Because, guys, that's when Jesus showed up. What did John the Baptist say? The beginning of his public ministry. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, 4,000 years of sacrifices were all pointing to the one who came. And as they were faithfully doing the sacrifices, they were doing it in anticipation of the one they couldn't have fully understood, but they were doing it by faith, out of obedience to Almighty God. See, that's why when they died, they didn't go directly into heaven. They went into Abraham's bosom. And then when Jesus died on the cross, he entered him in to what we now refer to as heaven. Guys, it's always been Jesus. Amen? It's always been Jesus. So I have a heart for the Jewish people. For 4,000 years, they're making sacrifices, pointing to Jesus, and now they miss Jesus. And you want to take them to Isaiah 53. Who's that talking about? Psalm 22. Who's that talking about? Look at every Old Testament sacrifice. They're all pointing to Jesus. He's the answer, guys. He's the hope. He's the Redeemer. He's the Savior of the world. Look at verse 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor, and I like the old King James, it says our our schoolmaster, to bring us to the cross that we might be justified by faith. And when I think of a schoolmaster, that's the word in the original Greek, one who was in charge of getting the children to and from school safely. He was enslaved and his job was to care for the children. But I think of an old school where there's one teacher, and he's in front of all the kids. And he gives them the word to help them understand. And that's what the law is. It's a schoolmaster for all of us that lead us to the cross. The Bible also talks about the law being a mirror. And you know what happens when you take the law and you put it up next, you know, in front of you, you see all the blemishes. Amen? You see where you've fallen short. But here's what we don't do. If I get up in the morning, and, and aren't you glad we don't like just come straight to church how we got up this morning? It'd be kind of scary, amen? It's scarier than Halloween costumes, amen? It'd be rough. I have very little hair, so that when I wake up, you know, I look like Jim from a Taxi, right? And, you know, and the reality is that, but when we look in the mirror and we see that there's, there's something there, we don't cleanse ourselves with the mirror. We don't take it down and rub the blemish off our face. It's not going to do any good. And see, the law reveals our sin, but it can't save us. The law shows us we need to be cleansed, but it can't cleanse us. It's a taskmaster, it's a tutor that leads us to the cross of Calvary. It reveals that we're sinners, which means we're in need of a Savior. It brings us to the cross. The only true source of justification is in Jesus Christ alone. The law is a standard that shows us we're sinners and that we need a Savior. If the law could do it on its own, we wouldn't need to bring us to Christ justified just as if I've never sinned, not by good works, not by the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of our souls. Verse 25, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Once Christ came into our lives, we've been born again. We're no longer under the tutor. The law has completed its work in our lives. 
The Old Testament still applies today. God reveals his nature, his moral laws, his guidelines for living, hundreds of prophetic pictures of Jesus Christ. If you come on Thursday nights, we see Jesus every week in the chapter. Can I get an amen to that? Every week. I love the Old Testament. It's interesting. When I get asked to go speak at conferences or, or fill in another church, nine times out of ten I teach how the Old Testament. Because I love the Old Testament and I love how it points to Jesus Christ. And it's tragic that so, so few people understand that. They're missing out on so much. So I love the Old Testament. Praise God for it. But guys, we're no longer under the law, but we're being led by Christ. We are in Christ. We are dwelt with by the Holy Spirit. It is the power of the Spirit and the love of our Lord that co combine to keep us on a path of righteousness now. You know what? I know when I sin, even at, how many of you guys know before you sin or as soon as you sin that you have sinned? And you've heard, you know what's coming. The Holy Spirit has, there it is, right? That's how I feel it, right there. Okay, Pastor Dave. Oh, it drives me to my knees. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And the mark of spiritual maturity is how quickly we recognize our sin is sin. Can we say amen to that? And then how quickly we respond to it. See, a hardened heart sins and doesn't feel convicted. There's, Bible, there's verses in the Bible which says they've hardened their heart most toward God and it has sin that's listed there. And there's a hardened heart and they, they shake their fist at God as they walk in open rebellion against Him. But guys, it's no longer the law that convicts me, even though the law helps me understand right from wrong. But it's the Holy Spirit who convicts me. Amen? He lives inside of me, and there's things that I, I may say or do, and I may not be able to find a verse that says it's wrong, but I'll be convicted. I shouldn't have done that. Because, guys, once you're born again, the Holy Spirit doesn't take vacations. Praise the Lord. Amen? That means you take him with you wherever you go. And when you're outside of his will, they're gonna, he's going to convict you. But when you're going through troubles and trials and difficulty, he's going to comfort you. And you know what else? When you're sharing your faith, he's going to speak through you. Amen? And when you read the Bible, he's going to help you understand it. That's what the Word of God says. Amen? So praise God we're not under the Old, you know, Old Testament law. We're walking in grace, filled with the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of the law is to show us that we're sinners in need of a Savior. Let's finish up. Just got a few verses left here. Verse 26, final point. The final point here of, of the law or the promise, we are all one in Christ. Now watch this. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We're all adopted into God's family. We're all sons and daughters of God through Christ Jesus. Not because we kept the law, not because of church membership, not because we were baptized. Baptism's great. Church membership's fine. You know, not because we did anything else. We didn't earn it, but because of who we are in Christ Jesus. Compared to what was being taught in Galatia, this was a revolutionary statement. The Judaizers were teaching your standing before God was based on your obedience to the law and tradition carried into Christianity by Jewish Christians to be truly close to God, to be considered sons of God. You had to be extremely observant of the law. You know, the Bible will also tell us that it's the weaker brethren who get caught, is more caught up in being legalistic. You understand that, right? We always think the one trying to keep the most laws is the most spiritually mature. That's not the case. The one who's fallen in love with Jesus will, will live a more holy life, but they're not striving to be better than other people. They just desire to be intimate and close to God. Can we say amen to that? I'm not worried about how if I'm, I'm, I'm better than you. I hope, I hope you're all better than me. Amen? That's not my desire. I just want to be closer to the Lord. You know why I hate it when I sin? Because it breaks my Savior's heart. You know what? By the grace of God, I will never, I will never commit adultery, okay? But by the grace of God, well, take heed lest you fall. But you know what? I know it would break my wife's heart. I know it would destroy my testimony in front of this church. I know it would destroy my ability to be, do what I'm called to do. But you know why I won't do it most of all? Because I know it will break my Savior's heart. See, when we, when we sin, we're breaking our, heart, our Savior's heart. See, I don't want to break his heart, amen? I want to walk in the center of his will. And I know he loves me. I know his love for me is unconditional. But I want to live in the center of his will. I want to be a man that God can use. He totally refutes their belief that they're all sons. Not the, not the religious few. He didn't say, hey, you Judaizers over here, you legalistic guys with the black robes, you're actually closer to God. Is that what it says? We're all sons. By faith in Jesus Christ. Intimate fellowship comes through faith, not by the law. Look what it says. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know, we've been immersed into Christ. What is the baptism a picture of? The death, burial, and the resurrection. 
that we've died to ourselves and we're now new creations in Christ, that we've joined in the death and burial of our Savior and His resurrection from the dead. So now we've been baptized into Christ, immersed into the Lord. Guys, it's not just testing the waters. I'll try God for a while and see how that works. These should be bumper stickers say, try Jesus. We don't try Jesus, we surrender to Jesus. We're, we're, we're in Christ, amen? We're fully submerged. I'm in all the way. See, I love when people get baptized. You know why? I love that public proclamation. I want everybody here to know that I'm, I'm dead to the person I used to be, and I'm a new creation in Christ, and I can't be more thankful for it, and I'm unashamed of it. Amen? amen? And we've been baptized into Christ. Guys, how can we keep it to ourselves, Amen? Baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. We've been clothed in Him, in His righteousness. We've been immersed, a reflection of Him, not promoting my good deeds, but His great work. See, when God says something like, you know, wow, I'm amazed how God, you, you know, I'm amazed how you teach or how you lead worship or how you, you know what that does? God gets all the glory for that because without Him, we couldn't do it. Amen? When people see amazing things that God is doing, it just glorifies God that he uses the sinful things and the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen? So when God does something great in us or through us, how blessed we are just to be a part of what God's doing. How blessed we are to be a tool in the hand of the master. Amen? And this is only possible because there's less of me and more of him. Amen? I've got to die to myself. It's all in Christ. Last two verses. There is neither Jew nor Greek. How do you think they like that part? These guys were saying, no, you've got to become more over here and you've got to be circumcised and you've got to keep the law of Moses and then you can be. And the apostle Paul, who knew the law better than any of them, got up and said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all not men or women, because we still are. It doesn't mean that we're not all uh, slaves, you know, all slaves are all free, because that's not true. Here's what he's saying. When it comes to our relationship with the Lord, we're all one in Christ. Amen? We've all been redeemed the same way. We've all been forgiven the same way. Jews didn't get there one way and the Greeks another way. Men there one way and women another way. Slaves one way and free people another way. We all come to Christ the same way. And we're all his children. Can we get an amen to that? We've all been adopted into his family. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be a Greek section in heaven. There's not going to be a wall between the men and the women because, you know, amen? We're all one in Christ. Praise the Lord for that, amen? And, and don't, please don't take this wrong because, man, if anybody knows me for five minutes, you know how much I love the Jewish people. But I've had people say to me, well, I'm twice blessed because I'm Jewish and I'm saved. I'm like, oh, well, that's great. And I think there's a great thing about having a Jewish heritage, but there's not going to be a better space in heaven for you. Well, I'm a pastor's kid, so I'm double blessed or something, or I'm double cursed, depending on how you look at it, right? <laughs> but, but I, you know, and somehow we think that there's something that elevates us to a different level than other people. Here's the reality. We deserve none of it. It's a free gift. We all got it from the Lord. He gets all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. We're going to heaven not because of us, but in spite of us and because of him. And we're just one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. Amen? These guys are losing their mind because they're so caught up in their legalism and got to, do, got to be baptized in our baptism or by our pastor after you go through seven weeks of training or you're not going to heaven. I had a guy tell me that, going door to door. Show me the verse for that and I'll do it. Show me the verse. Well, you know, it's not in the Greek either. Don't start with me. Amen? <laughs> the reality is we're all one in Christ and I love that. And finally he says, and if we are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when he was talking about the blessing that would come through Abraham to all nations, that's Jesus. And guess what? Abraham's our father too in that sense. Does that make sense? Because he's the father of faith, right? And we too have faith in Jesus Christ. And we're all one in him. And he's talking to this group that's trying to divide between Jews and Gentiles. And we don't do that anymore. It's, here's the only division that matters, saved and unsaved. Born again, lost. Amen? There's no other division. That's the only division. We're all one in Christ. So, in closing, I told you I was going to tell you, then I told you, so I'll tell you what I told you. Amen? We're heirs not based on, on our heritage. We're heirs not based on the law. 
We're heirs not based on good works, but according to his promise. So, by law, by promise, we saw the curse of the law, its sentence of condemnation and death. We saw the unchanging promise that we have in Christ, salvation through faith in Christ, his redeeming work on the cross, not through keeping the law. We saw the purpose of the law. You know, if the law can't save us, why does it exist? To bring us to the cross. And then we saw that we're all one in Christ. Guys, I'm as excited when somebody gets saved at the church down the street as when they get saved here. I'm as excited to hear when God's doing great things in someone's life half a world away as when they're doing it down the street. Can I get an amen to that? Because guys, we're all family and we're all one in Christ. Amen? And I love the Jewish people. God's not done with them. He's got great things in store for them. Much of it may come after the rapture of the church. But I'm in this city because I love those people. And we're all one in Christ. Can I get an amen to that? That's who we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your infinite mercy. We thank you, Lord, for this clear picture that our salvation doesn't come by us being good, but by your great grace. It's not something we've earned. It's not something we deserve. It's something that was poured out upon us by your grace. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved to the glory of the Father. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you know you're a sinner and you want to be forgiven, if you're ready to surrender your life to the Lord, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, if that's your desire this morning, I want you to just raise your hand so I can pray with you. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Lord, we do love you. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. And Lord, we can't believe how much you love us. We're so unworthy of it. Lord, help us to love you in the way that you love us. Help us to love others in the way that you love others. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, is he worthy to be worshipped? Let's worship him.